Hello and welcome to another video looking at the autonomic nervous system. This time we're going to be focusing in on the autonomics, the sympathetics and parasympathetic nerves that innervate targets in the head and neck. So let's get started first by looking at the parasympathetics and doing a brief overview of those before we move on to a little more detailed drawing. So all the parasympathetics have to have a two neuron chain that gets them to their final target tissue. So as a consequence, we need to have a pre-synaptic nucleus where those cell bodies are located. We then need to have a pre-synaptic pathway that these are going to follow to get to the second cells. And the second nerve cells in this chain are located in a peripheral ganglion. And that ganglion changes for each cranial nerve that's involved, but it's going to be a consistent pathway in this sense. So from the ganglion, the postsynaptic axons have to follow a pathway and eventually get to their target tissue. So let's start off with a brief overview. The first one that we care about and the cranial nerves that are in the head and neck that carry parasympathetics are three, the oculomotor nerve, seven, the facial nerve, nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve, and 10, the vagus nerve. So starting with three, oculomotor, it receives its presynaptic nuclei from the midbrain's Edinger Westfall nucleus. And I should say at this time, most gross anatomy courses don't require you to know the central nuclei. That gets covered a little bit later, so consult with your instructor to see if that's something you need to be concerned about. Most gross anatomy courses start with the cranial nerve and move from there. But we're including this just for the sake of completeness. So from the oculomotor nerve, the parasympathetics travel to the ciliary ganglion inside the orbit. From there, they jump on short ciliary branches of the trigeminal nerve, V1, to get to the iris and the pupillary constrictors there, as well as the ciliary body and the circular fibers that allow the lens to accommodate and round up. Now next up we have cranial nerve 7. And 7 is interesting in a couple ways. Now first off, it gets its presynaptic axons from the superior salivatory nucleus, which gives you some indication of what's going to be happening when this gets to its final target. And seven's interesting in the sense that it has two ganglia that receive those axons. The first is the tergo palatine, and the second is the submandibular. Now from the tergopalatine ganglia, postsynaptic axons extend to get to the lacrimal gland, and they do that by following branches of V2 and then V1, so the maxillary and ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, and its target is the lacrimal gland. So producing tears in the eye, whereas the submandibular gland sends its axons along a little nerve called the corda tympani, which then joins a branch of V3 called the lingual nerve. And from there, actually I should change that, the corda tympani goes to the submandibular gland by the lingual nerve, then it jumps back on the lingual nerve to get to the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands inside the oral cavity or just outside the oral cavity, emptying into it. Next up, we have cranial nerve 9, glossopharyngeal. No big surprise, it's getting its presynaptic axons from the inferior salivatory nucleus. And through a very complicated pathway, it eventually gets to the otic ganglion, which then sends its postsynaptic parasympathetic axons along a branch of the trigeminal nerve, the mandibular division of it, specifically the auriculotemporal division, 
to get to the parotid gland, the major salivary gland secreting aqueous fluid into the oral cavity. So that's it for him. And then last up is 10, the vagus nerve. Vagus nerves, presynaptic parasympathetics come from the dorsal motor nucleus of 10, the vagus nerve. And thankfully for this video, that's it. Because these presynaptic parasympathetics don't stay in the head and neck, they travel down through the neck and the carotid sheath to get to the thorax, organs of the abdomen, most of the digestive tract and glands up until about the descending colon. And so, since that's been covered in other videos, we're gonna take it as read and move on from there. So let's take a little more sophisticated look at the parasympathetics of the head by starting with the ciliary ganglion receiving presynaptic parasympathetics from cranial nerve three, the oculum motor. So cranial nerve three. So cranial nerve three starts out in the midbrain portion of the central nervous system. It's gonna be located right about here. So that's gonna be that Edinger-Westfall nucleus we talked about previously. And it's located in close association to the oculomotor nucleus. So right here is Edinger, Westfall, nucleus, closely, uh, closely associated with the oculomotor. Now both of these are gonna send their axons out from the midbrain and they travel in close association to one another and are pretty much the exact same nerve. So whenever someone talks about cranial nerve three, they're talking about the combination of those nerve bundles running together. And so these guys exit the midbrain, travel into the dura mater, and the first major, I don't want to say obstacle, but sort of a structure they encounter is the cavernous sinus. Now the cavernous sinus is a dural venous sinus. It's full of blood. In addition to cranial nerve three, we've also got cranial nerves four, six, and the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal running through there. Some people say V2 or the maxillary branch of the trigeminal goes through there too, which is fine. As it exits that, these nerves are then going to have to go through the skull and enter the orbit by going through the superior orbital fissure. So two structures they pass through are the cavernous sinus, and in the cavernous sinus, they can get exposed to thrombi if you get blood clotting or an infection in that area. Then the superior orbital fissure, one of the many holes that's going to be associated with the sphenoid bone. But for right now, we'll just assume they get through there a-okay. Traveling together, bundled together is cranial nerve three. Now, once they get in there, Cranial nerve three, the axons from the oculomotor nucleus, go and do their job. And their job is to innervate extra ocular muscles. We'll talk a little bit more about that, hopefully in a subsequent video. But it's gonna innervate all of the muscles around the eye with the exception of the abducens goes to the lateral rectus and the trochlear nerve goes to the superior oblique muscle. But we'll leave that alone for right now. And instead, follow the parasympathetics, which then make their way to their associated ganglia. And as we discussed before, the ganglion associated with cranial nerve three is the ciliary ganglion. And there, it synapses with those cell bodies. Now, what's going on here is a little bit more interesting in a way is that the presynaptics were jumping on three, but the postsynaptics have to jump on a branch of five, the trigeminal nerve. So traveling through the eye, we have some long ciliary nerves and some short ciliary nerves that are traveling to the back of the eyeball. Honestly, they're just called ciliary because they're going to the eye, and the short ciliaries make a little detour through the ciliary ganglion. So the short ciliary nerves are the ones that the postsynaptic parasympathetics take advantage of and follow to get to the eye. And right now, let's draw a super realistic view of the eyeball. Hopefully the irony was not lost on anyone there. 
and essentially those short and long ciliary nerves are going to the eye to innervate it in terms of sensory activity, so knowing when your eyeball gets touched, and your postsynaptic parasympathetics from the short ciliary get there as well. But instead of sensory, they're motor, and what they're motor to are two specialized bundles of circular smooth muscle inside the eye, and we've got a little cross section of the eye that I'm using right here to show those off. And it may be a little confusing at the moment, but if you covered the eye anatomy at all, these guys will be a little bit obvious to you in just a second. So those muscles that are innervated are the iris right here. Here's the pupil and the cornea right here. Iris, and then this structure is called the ciliary body. And the ciliary body and the iris both contain circular bundles of smooth muscle, and that is the final target of these parasympathetic fibers that are traveling into the eye. Now the iris is going to contract and expand to allow a certain amount of light in to reach the retina. The ciliary body, however, is the structure that modulates the focus by adjusting the thickness of the lens. So here's the lens, and then there's fibers that attach it to the ciliary body called zonular fibers. And the contraction and relaxation of the ciliary body affects the roundness or thinness of the lens to allow light to get focused more directly onto the retina. So the two targets, the ciliary body and the iris, we'll take a closer look at right now. So to get a sense of what the parasympathetics are actually doing inside the eye, let's draw a pupil in here. Apologize for the lack of artistic skill going into this. And the pupil is really just a space, and it's surrounded by the iris. Now the iris has several types of mu muscle inside of it. We're concerned right now with the circular smooth muscle bundles inside the iris that are innervated by the parasympathetics. And what happens when parasympathetic stimulation happens is these guys contract around each other and constrict and draw really close, like a sphincter contracting. And in that sense, what they wind up doing is constricting the pupil, making the pupil that much smaller so that when you enter a bright room or you suddenly have light shown in your eyes, the pupil will constrict. And because the parasympathetics that allow constriction to happen travel on cranial nerve three, you check someone's eyes to see if they are going to be intact by shining the light in, seeing if the pupils constrict, and that lets you know that potentially there's a problem either with cranial nerve 2, which detects the light, or cranial nerve 3, which allows the retina to constrict. Now to get a sense of what the ciliary body is doing, it's really very similar, but we have to, it's a little difficult to understand initially. If we were to take the iris off and look behind it, what we'd see is the lens hanging out right behind there allowing the light to focus and surrounding the lens also circular is that ciliary body and I'm drawing little hash marks in right now so the ciliary body and the lens are connected by these zonular fibers and that's what keeps the lens tied to and tethered to the ciliary body. Just like the iris, the parasympathetics innervate circular fibers of smooth muscle, bundles of smooth muscle that are located inside the ciliary body and when they contract they're going to do the exact same thing. They're going to cause it to constrict, they're going to cause the lens to get rounder and accommodate to look at closer things. Now this gave me a lot of trouble when I initially was trying to learn how this works and I think I can explain it in a way that makes a little bit of sense. So if we take a cross section through the, uh, the lens and the ciliary body right there, what we'd see is a little something like this. Here's that ciliary body on one side ciliary body on the other side. 
and lens right in the middle and zonular fibers run into it. Now inside the ciliary body we said there are bundles of smooth muscle running in a circle and with flat lens doesn't deflect light much refracts it just a little bit as it enters and heads back towards the retina and what always gave me trouble is the lens it seems like it ought to move out these only fibers ought to pull on it and make it wider but that or pardon me make it thinner but that's not actually what happens as these fibers constrict the lens is innately elastic it wants to be rounder so as these guys constrict the lens finally has some of that pressure relieved and it rounds up ciliary bodies are closer to one another zonier fibers still connecting the two and that accommodation that rounding of the lens diffracts light or refracts light pardon me a lot more sharply so that closer objects can still be kept in view as we go through and try to keep things in focus. So that's it for cranial nerve 3. We'll come back with cranial nerve 7 in just a minute. Alright, next up let's take a look at cranial nerve number 7 and the parasympathetics that accompany it. Now, there's lots going on here so we'll just get started once again draw the central nervous system out try to get a sense of where we're at in this whole process so cranial nerve 7 the parasympathetics associated with it come from a collection of cell bodies in the brain stem referred to as the superior salivatory nucleus And just like before, they are in close association with some other nuclei that are going to be making up a bit of the facial nerve. And in this case, we're going to pay attention mostly to the facial motor nucleus, which is going to send fibers out to skeletal muscles around the face. And these two, along with some other axons that are coming and going, exit the brain stem. And the first thing they pass through, as they pass into the temporal bone, is called the internal acoustic meatus. And this hole, 7 and cranial nerve 8, go through there at the same time. And if you have signs that relate to both of those, you might be thinking that there's a problem at this point as those two nerves enter the temporal bone. So cranial nerve 7, we'll pay attention to the motor fibers here, specifically for a moment. Next stop for it is the middle ear. And this is a space containing the middle ear ossicles, the malleus, the incus, stapes. And cranial nerve 7 goes through there, makes a little bit of a sharp bend. There's some sensory cell bodies located here, but we'll save that for another day. Passes down through the skull gives up a little motor branch to the stapes, uh, stapedius muscle as it exits and it goes through a hole in the skull that's referred to as the stylomastoid foramen. Funny enough, located between the styloid and mastoid processes. And once it gets out on the face it has five canonical branches that go to the various muscles of facial expression. Now the autonomics, the parasympathetics that are associated with seven, follow it for a little bit of that way, but they split off. And the first autonomic branch that splits off does so before we get to the middle ear. And that's going to head through the petrous temporal bone, and for that reason, is referred to as the greater petrosal nerve.
but some parasympathetics continue on and don't leave until they're within the middle ear. And because those fibers exit within the middle ear, that little nerve branch is called the corda, little cord or thread, tympani of the middle ear. So greater petrosal and corda tympani nerves are the parasympathetic fibers that are exiting and leaving seven. And at that point, that's pretty much it. We're going to follow each of these in sequence now. The greater petrosal travels through the petrous portion of the temporal bone and passes through a little hole of bone. It's called the pterygoid canal. Sometimes also called the vidian canal. And as it passes through the vidian canal, it winds up very close to its ganglion, where it's going to synapse with those postsynaptic parasympathetics. And as you recall, the greater petrosal nerve and facial nerves, parasympathetics, one of the ganglia it associates with is this one, the tergo palatine ganglion. Now that would be nice, but it can't obviously be that simple. We have to get some branches of five in here to take these postsynaptic parasympathetics to their final target. And the teaser on this is going to be, I'll draw on the target right now. The main target we're worried about is way up in the lateral corner of the orbit. And that's the lacrimal gland. Produces tears. So how do we get there? Well, we have to follow a branch of the trigeminal, and the branch that comes in here is the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve, V2. That enters this same area, travels nearby, and gives off several branches. Two branches go down to the palate. And I'm not going to write these in, but they're the greater and lesser palatine nerves. Another branch continues through the maxillary air sinuses to come out just below the eye. That's the infraorbital nerve. And two other branches leave kind of in close contact with one another and head out to the skin just on the lateral side of the temple or just to the lateral side of the orbit. And those guys are long-winded zygomatico facial and zygo Matico temporal. Sorry for all the detail, but just in case any of you need it, we'll put that in there. And then again, the infra orbital nerve right here. And then the greater and lesser palatine nerves. Now, there are little glands inside the palate, inside the maxillary sinus that need parasympathetic postsynaptics and your tergopalatine ganglion is going to supply those little tiny glands with their parasympathetic innervation. So there will be little parasympathetics following along here. But the ones that we're most interested in right now jump on the zygomaticofacial and then zygomaticotemporal to get to the lacrimal gland. The problem is, even though it's close, zygomaticotemporal doesn't get to the lacrimal gland for whatever reason, we've got another branch of the trigeminal nerve, the lacrimal nerve, which is a branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal, passes nearby to get to the skin just outside the orbit. So that is the lacrimal nerve, which is a branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal. And these postsynaptic parasympathetics do something relatively unknown, kind of uh, uncharacteristic. They jump off and travel alone for a tiny little bit and then jump on the lacrimal nerve. And once they get there, they follow it all the way to their target, the lacrimal gland. And that takes care of the first pathway that we're going to care about. Let's get on to number two. Head on back to the corda tympani. Now corda tympani travels through the temporal bone for a little while and it finally exits very far medial to the mandible in the infratemporal fossa. And it goes through a tiny little cleft of bone. It's 
called the Petro Tympanic Fissure. And it's going to travel down, and its goal is to get to the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. As usual, it's going to have to get on a branch of the trigeminal to get there. And the branch it travels on is a branch of V3, the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, specifically the lingual nerve is the branch of it that it jumps on. Now the lingual nerve, its main job is to come down and provide sensation or carry sensory information from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So that's where it's heading. The corda tympani inside the infratemporal fossa jumps on, travels down with the lingual nerve until it gets to its ganglion, which is hanging out just a little inferior to the lingual nerve, and that is the submandibular ganglion. Now, what this wants to get to, wants to get to the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. And fortunately for it, the lingual branch of the maxillary, pardon me, the mandibular nerve, let me draw this in, also has sensation a little bit on the inside there, and it's going to have some sensory branches that come down in the vicinity of these glands. And so, the postsynaptic parasympathetic inputs from the submandibular ganglion will just jump onto branches of the lingual nerve that get to the region of the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. So we'll just draw that in there. And that completes the parasympathetics associated with cranial nerve 7. All right, next up, let's take a look at the parasympathetics associated with cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. So, as with everything else, these guys have to originate in the central nervous system. And in this case, they are coming from a medullary nucleus. It's called the inferior salivatory nucleus. Now, there's several nuclei associated with nine. The one that's going to be the most helpful for the moment for us to kind of help follow is the one that supplies motor innervation to a single muscle of the pharynx. It does, this nucleus does other stuff with a different nerve, but basically this nucleus, the nucleus and vigus, and I'm assured that is actually the way that's supposed to be spelled in this regard, sends out motor innervation to a single muscle. And so these guys bundle together as part of cranial nerve 9. They exit the skull at the jugular foramen and they do so along with cranial nerve 10, the vagus, and cranial nerve 11, the spinal accessory. For right now, let's stick with the motor axons, and as I said before, they're going to head out and go into the pharynx and innervate a single muscle, the stylopharyngeus. And the parasympathetics are going to have a fairly interesting pathway. They're going to exit the skull through the jugular foramen alongside these guys, then they're going to take a quick, sharp turn and re-enter the skull through a little hole, and I mean little, called the tympanic canaliculus. And they are going to travel through the temporal bone until they reach the middle ear, which we saw before with cranial nerve 7. 
So this little nerve, these parasympathetics are traveling to get to the middle ear, and it's referred to as the tympanic nerve. Now, lest you think that's all that's going on here, cranial nerve 9 is sensory to the middle ear, the auditory tube, or the phrangotympanic tube, and is uh, sensory to the inside of the tympanic membrane. So it's fairly extensive sensory innervation is here in the middle ear, and these sensory axons head back to the brain stem along the tympanic nerve, through the tympanic canaliculus, back up to the jugular foramen, until they get to the brain stem and enter the spinal trigeminal nucleus. So just want to give you a heads up that the tympanic nerve is not strictly parasympathetic, but it has sensory cells with it. Now the parasympathetics associated with the tympanic nerve continue through the middle ear and then well and truly do become strictly parasympathetic. And this, as it travels through the petrous portion of the temporal bone, is now known as the lesser petrosal nerve. Don't get it confused with the greater petrosal, that was seven. Lesser petrosal is from nine. Now at this point, it wants to get to its ganglion, and that's called the otic ganglion, but to get there it has to find its branch of this trigeminal nerve, and in this case, it's V3, the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. It's going to exit the skull through a hole called the foramen ovale. And it's going to supply motor branches to the muscles of mastication, sensory branches to the tongue, such as the lingual nerve, the inferior alveolar nerve, the buccal nerve. And it's also going to give off a branch that goes towards the ear. This is the one we care the most about right now. It is called the auricular or auriculo temporal nerve. And what's important about it is that it's very close to and runs really right across the biggest salivary gland we have just in front of our ear. That's the parotid gland. And that is where the parasympathetics associated with cranial nerve 9 want to get. So how do they do it? Well, the lesser petrosal travels through the petrous portion of the temporal bone and comes very close to cranial nerve V3, mandibular branch of trigeminal, and its ganglion is actually located on the medial side of V3. This is the otic ganglion. So lesser petrosal travels through the foramen ovale, gets to its ganglion right there, and the otic does something very sensible and very nice for the rest of us. It just travels on the auriculotemporal nerve close to the parotid and gets to the parotid innervates it. And these parasympathetics, when they get to their salivary glands, in the case of the otic ganglion to the parotid, submandibular to the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands, the tergopalatine ganglion to the lacrimal glands and the little tiny glands in the palate and the nasal cavity, all these guys are going to do is cause them to secrete, make us salivate, make us cry, or create some mucus and so forth for the inside of the oral and nasal cavity. And, as I said before, parasympathetics associated with cranial nerve 10 don't really do a whole lot in the head and neck themselves. They're more involved with thoracic and abdominal viscera. We've covered that already, and that takes us to the end of the parasympathetic innervation of the head and neck. All we've got to do now is go through the other half, which is the sympathetics. Thankfully, they're not quite as involved, and we can get through them relatively quickly. Back with that in just a second. All right, so let's take a look at the sympathetic nervous system as it applies to the head and neck. Now, if you've seen the other videos that I've posted related to the autonomic nervous system in the body, you may have already seen this. We'll do a quick refresher just in case. But here we've got brain, brainstem, spinal cord, and the cell bodies for the sympathetic system, the presynaptic sympathetics, all come from the T1 to about the L2 or L3 level of the spinal cord. And if we were to take a cross section here, what we'd see is a lot of white matter tracts on the outside of the spinal cord and gray matter or neuron cell bodies located on the inside making roughly kind of 
H or butterfly shaped structure there. So let's color in the anterior or ventral horn right here, where a lot of motor axons are. Then the dorsal or posterior horns back here tend to be more sensory. And if you have sympathetic cells, they're located neither in the posterior or anterior horn, but in the intermedial lateral cell column, a specialized little area right there. Now we'll avoid that for a second and keep drawing the nerve roots, the anterior root, meaning the posterior root here and forming the spinal nerve. And then the spinal nerve is going to split into a posterior or dorsal ramus and an anterior or ventral ramus. Now, especially regarding the sympathetics, we have to take a couple more into account. There's two kind of pathways that these axons can take to get to the ganglia of the sympathetic system, the paravertebral ganglia. So let's start by tracing this presynaptic sympathetic from here. Intermedial lateral cell column goes through the anterior root, the motor root, joins the spinal nerve. And instead of going into a posterior or anterior ramus, it goes through a white rami communicans. Now at this point, it can either synapse here and travel through this other um, pathway, the gray rami communicans, and go to the body. If it's going to the head and neck, however, it's probably going to be located in the upper thoracic, maybe roughly the T1 to about T4, T5 region. It is going to actually not synapse here, not leave as a splanchnic, but instead it is going to ascend through the sympathetic chain up, 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 up to a th three ganglia, the superior, middle, or inferior cervical ganglia. So let's just draw those guys in. Kind of a little cartoony form here. So these axons can ascend through the sympathetic chain to the inferior, middle, or superior cervical ganglia. Now if they synapse in the inferior or middle cervical ganglia, then these guys are just going to exit through gray rami and join the cervical spinal nerves, posterior and anterior ramus, ditto for the middle cervical ganglia, and they're going to do what sympathetics do all over the body. They're going to go to sweat glands, erector pili muscles, the muscles, smooth muscles that pull your hairs up on end, and pre-capillary sphincters controlling the blood flow to the skin and the muscle. So these guys, the inferior and middle cervical ganglia, act pretty much like sympathetics do everywhere else. When we find things getting interesting is when we reach the superior cervical ganglia, the end of the sympathetic chain. What happens here is it will synapse and these large, large number of postsynaptic sympathetics need to get to the face. And they're going to go to all these same things in the face. Sweat glands, erector pili, precapillary sphincters, and a couple other specialized functions. But to do it, they do something a little bit special. They jump on the big arteries that are running very close to the sympathetic chain. And the biggest and most obvious arteries in the area are the two carotid arteries that are nearby. The external and internal carotid arteries branching off of the common carotid artery. So when these sympathetic synapse in the superior cervical ganglion, they jump onto the common internal and external carotid arteries and they just form a big cobweb or plexus of sympathetic cell axons traveling with those vessels wherever they go. And that is largely how they get to all the structures of the head and neck that they need to. They follow the vasculature to get there. There are a couple special exceptions and we'll cover those right now. Now the first, not really exception to the rule, but modification of it is pretty closely tied with the function of cranial nerve 3. So let's put this little picture back up here and we'll draw in our inferior, middle, and superior cervical ganglion containing the sympathetics and we'll draw in the common carotid artery branching off into the external 
and internal carotid arteries. So keep in mind we've got a lot of sympathetic cells forming big network, big plexus across all of these, getting to various structures through that carotid plexus. Sweat glands, erector pili, precapillary sphincters, and they're going to be present anywhere we have a branch of the internal external carotid artery from here on out. The internal carotid artery doesn't give off many branches. In fact, the only real branch it gives off before it gets to the base of the brain happens inside the cavernous sinus. So the internal carotid artery travels all the way up and through, makes a little bit of a U-bend inside the cavernous sinus. And right at that U, it gives off a little tiny artery, and that is the ophthalmic artery. So the ophthalmic artery is this little guy right here. Almost forgot that H. And instead of going through the superior orbital fissure, it travels through the nearby optic canal. And it does that along with cranial nerve 2, the optic nerve. So that vessel is traveling through, and its role, it wants to get to the eye. So it is going to be supplying blood to all the structures in the orbit, as well as a little vessel that travels in the retina, well, pardon me, in the optic nerve to the retina itself. So if these sympathetics, these postsynaptic sympathetics are traveling along, they're on the optic, pardon me, the ophthalmic artery and the optic canal as well. Now, once they come through, they jump off into the ciliary ganglion. But being postsynaptic sympathetics, they don't synapse there, they just travel through. And their goal is to get to not so much the ciliary body, but the iris. And what do sympathetics do in the iris? What's happening here what we talked about before, the constriction of the pupil is caused by parasympathetic input. But the sympathetics also have inputs to the pupil. Let's say we've already got a constricted pupil right here. Sympathetic input does not innervate the circular muscles of the iris. Instead, they innervate radial muscles, ones that are running like little spokes out from this area. So when they contract, they are going to cause the pupil to open up, to dilate. And that, if anyone's had their eye exam done where they put the little drops in there, you're very familiar with this appearance, makes the pupil very big, allows a great deal of light through, and basically is the complete opposite effect that we saw before with the parasympathetics. So once again, sympathetics and parasympathetics are acting in somewhat adversarial manner in the way that they maneuver the eye. All right, that is 99% of what you need to know about the sympathetics related to the head and neck. Be happy. The remaining 1% has to do with cranial nerve 7. And it's very, very quick. So we put cranial nerve 7 back up here. Nobody panic. What's going on is as the internal carotid artery ascends, making its way towards the cavernous sinus, and along with it, all that carotid plexus, a small branch of it jumps off all on its own to go into the pterygoid canal. And this little twig right here is referred to as the deep petrosal nerve. So remember, greater petrosal, 7, to pterygopalatine ganglion, lesser petrosal, 9, to otic ganglion, and deep petrosal are pre, pardon me, postsynaptic sympathetic axons that travel through the pterygoid or vidian canal, 
get here, and just like before, they get to the trigopalatine ganglion, but they do not synapse there. And these postsynaptic sympathetic axons just travel and piggyback along with these guys to get to the capillary sphincters associated with all these branches. So it's another route that they can take in addition to following the carotid arteries to their final destination. Be happy. That is it for the autonomic nervous system in relation to the head and neck.